1996, he achieved fellowship in the Academy of General Dennis in recognition of over 3,000 hours of advanced education in dentistry. For the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine, he's been a board member, secretary treasurer, and president-elect. In 2006, he achieved certification by the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine. Folks, I want to introduce you to Steve Carson. Oh, thanks. I don't need that. David's got me covered. So thank you for coming tonight. I appreciate Tom and Ed for inviting me to talk about an exciting new product. I've been using mine, my personal one since May. I've been able to provide it for patients since uh, a few, about two months now. And so I have some clinical experience I'd love to share with you about that. So one of the things that's uh, common to all of our appliances that we make is we have custom fitted trays. And what we've been able to do for the longest time, for 25 years I've been making appliances, is make these off of models and fit them on there, vacuum form them, push them down, make them out of powder and liquid. Still a good process, but they've advanced that now to milling, and milling makes it fit much better. As we see the upper plate, it has a milled uh, shell, so it's rigid, but it also has a milled soft liner. First time in the world, Neil, when he was telling me about these things, said that it took him 18 months to find the right milling machine for the right product to make it a soft liner. So when you put it in a patient's mouth, it slides in over the teeth. It's wonderful fit. And I can uh, tell patients, look, it's not going to let your teeth move because it fits well like a retainer. So I'm a, I like that as a feature for them. And then on the bottom, we, oh, we have the strap system now. It's really interesting about straps. You know, when you think about how we're going to hold the jaw forward, this is innovative. This is new. We haven't seen this before. There's actually another device on the market that uses little rubber bands for this. And I, I never trusted that one. But then when they told me about the polyamide product that's this, that is this, and they went through all the technical parts, I'm thinking, well, that'll work. And in my mouth, it's worked great for a couple months. In my patient's mouth now for, uh, well, actually, my mouth since May, like I said. So we have a, it's, it's innovative. It, it fits well. It's got some features to it I'll tell you more about as we go forward with this. I started with Son and Ed. Gosh, I um, can't remember exactly when it was, what the years were. I probably should have looked that up. But uh, uh, many years ago, I was working with uh, one type of an appliance for the most part. And then Solomon came along and said, we want to do an educational program. We want to do better at teaching other dentists. And uh, hired a, a new director for education, and he basically hired me. And I started looking into the product, and I really liked the company. I liked the product back when it was a dors just a dorsal design. And so I did a lot of teaching for Sonomad for several years. And, and I've made a connection with a company that I really enjoyed. And, and I, I, I like that a lot. The product has always been an excellent product. And so I used a, a ton of these. And I teach a lot of dentists about how to do appliance therapy in their practices. And one of the things I've been teaching for as long as I've known is I, uh, for new dentists out there getting started with this, I say, if you want to make an appliance your patients are going to like, then make a Sonomed dorsal because it's a, it's a reliable company. It'll be made well. Your patients will like it. It'll be easy for you to get used to, and it'll be a success. And if, as, if it's a success, then it's much more likely you're going to do another one, and then another one after that, and pretty soon you've made a difference in your patient health community. So I think that that was, the door, that was what I've been teaching about the dorsal design for a long time. And now we've got a different one that we can say the same thing about. In fact, it's going to be even easier to make a success out of the Sonomed Avant. So I'm excited about this as a now brand new uh, dentist thinking, well, I, I'm not so sure about this. I don't know if I can do this right. Make one of these because you won't have to worry about the appliance. That'll be the easy part for you. So I'm excited about that. So when we think about all the different choices out there, there's a lot of choices for the, this uh, uh, profession. We've got a 150 different or, or appliances out there, several different designs available from the FDA. And so as we go through our practices, we, one of the things we have to learn how to do is we have to learn how to match our patients uh, to the right appliance. So we think about characteristics of the device. Dr. Pankey, when he taught us about how to do dentistry, he said, you got to get to know your equipment, know your work, make sure you understand the features of the devices that you're going to use. And then also you have to know your patient, he said. So as we, as we get uh, to know, well, what's about our patient that has their concerns? What is it that they're going to be interested in making sure it works for them? 
And so we think about choices and we have good things in many ways. I mean, it's not like any of the choices we have are bad choices. We just have to make sure they match well to the particular patients. So we think about this and we have, if we have a, a, a strap system like the Salon de then they can move in a lot of different ways. They can have a lot of freedom of motion. It works for them for that. And as I, I put it in patient's mouth and I say, well, how does that feel? They say, well, can I talk with this? And I, and I remind them they're talking with it dead, you know, so they can make themselves understood because they can open their mouth a little bit. I have a lot of patients who say, well, I, I worry about being, having my mouth locked closed. I can't do that. So they're claustrophobic. And I, I'm able to give them a salmon bed avant, avant because they can open their mouth a little bit. They can take a drink of water. They can talk to their bed partner if they need to. And, uh, but it also has the benefit of some of the other devices that hold the jaw forward appropriately. One of the big features about treating people with sleep apnea is that when they're supine on their back, they're going to have the worst breathing they can because the jaw can fall backwards. So what we have to guard against is that jaw falling backwards. And some of the other designs will more freely let the jaw move open and backwards if you don't control it there differently. So we have more rigid devices, but we also have now, the, the, with the Avant, we can um, show that, I saw that look, I'm supposed to say Salmon Avant, sorry. So I got coached earlier than that. <laughs> Anyway, so we have this, which you can, you can move, but you're, yet you're, you have a defined path of motion. motion. It's not going to let you fall backwards. All right. So sometimes we need to restrict what our patients can do. So we have uh, devices that have some uh, more restrictive side uh, mechanisms, more, all holding the jaw forward. But what I like about the Salman Dan Avant is that you can move in many different directions. You can move open. You can move side to side because the strap system allows some flexibility there. And you can move forward and back a little bit. And the, uh, all those things allow our patients to feel like it's more natural in their mouth. Now it is something different still. You still got something in their mouth that's going to be restrictive, but the least restrictive we can give them, the more comfortable it's going to be. And if we think about the, what the cheek feel is like on these devices, when you have something as smooth as a a little post in the back and a, uh, the polyamide strap, then what you're going to, the patients are going to come back and say, well, you know, I don't notice that to be a problem with my cheek. And that's certainly been my clinical experience over the past couple months as I've delivered these, is when I send patients home with uh, some of the devices, they come back and say, well, how's my, you know, my cheeks are sore. And they'll get over that. It, they, we, can, we can do that. But isn't it better to start when we have one that doesn't have that? And, that's what I found in my, in my experience, too. Another thing that we have to think about as our patients are using these jaw forward devices is um, how rigid is it? I mean, do, they get, do we give them a chance to move where they want to move? And we can make things nice and stable. So when people uh, clench down on it, uh, the, then the, the, the all acrylic planes that are between the occlusal surfaces will give them a chance to exercise those muscles if they're going to do that and spread the forces out over lots of different surface area. It helps a lot of patients who are bruxers and grinders match up what they're going to still do with, with a device that doesn't allow that force to end up moving teeth. So if we think about how rigid a device is, if we give them a limited a range of motion side to side, then if we have a bruxer, what they might do is they might break the limitations. And I've had this happen on some devices where they've, you know, we have a known Bruxer, we give them a, a device that fits really great and they have a lot of surface area and they, they end up going laterally enough that they break down a device. So we have now a device that you can move side to side and your jaw still doesn't fall back and yet it's not going to break because it has that built in flexibility. So quite a bit different than the ones that are, have to be wedged forward that way. So what it boils down to really is are your patients going to be happy or unhappy with the device? They just uh, published a study about uh, CPAP, but it's a, could, we could translate this for oral appliances as well, is if the patient isn't happy really right from the start, it's very difficult to get them to go from a new device that they're excited about to, to something that doesn't fit, it's uncomfortable, and they have to overcome that barrier, and then later be encouraged to pick it up and start over again. That's harder than it is if we give them a device that's straight away comfortable. 
that it's sure it's different. It's, it's a little big in their mouth. It causes a few transient side effects. All of them do that. But if we can start with a device that they can accept fairly early, then we can build expectations for success and they're going to start out happier and come back with the kind of rewards that we want, which is medically improving. But more importantly than that, we have to address their needs, their high perceived benefit. There's a quote in the uh, Principles and Practices of, Dental Sleep, of, of Sleep Medicine that said the highest uh, matching the patients to, to their perceived benefit and the ones that get a, a high value out of their benefit are the most likely to carry on the treatment. It's one of the reasons I think CPAP has a problem is because when people get, are given a mask without proper coaching and care and they have to deal with all this extra stuff, then they're mo far more likely to abandon therapy. If we can help our patients see that there is a way to keep their airway open, address the medical concerns, address the quality of life concerns that drove them in to get the diagnosis in the first place, and they can see that barrier as being fairly low, you know, it fits, it doesn't hurt, it's, e it's easy, it doesn't make my cheeks hurt, then we can get people happy straight away. And that's going to lead to longer term use, it's going to lead to more consistent use, because with fewer barriers there's much more likelihood that they're going to pick it up off the bathroom counter and actually put it in every night and then deal with a little bit of troublesomeness that comes with any therapy that has to that insists on the patient to cooperating with that therapy. So the key here is does it fit well, does it feel good, is it professional? And one of the things I like about this device is that when it's, it's first of all, it's nice and small, but it's also super easy to keep clean. And so it looks great. And mine, you know, it's, admittedly, I've only been using it since May, so I haven't had it for four or five years. But my, my device I've been wearing every night since May looks like the day I put it in in May. It's super easy to keep clean. It, it, it doesn't get grody looking later on. I'm, I'm confident it's going to stay that way. And so patients like that. It looks professional. One of the problems we have in this, in this area is it's easy to buy a really inexpensive, simple device that we can put in people, patients' mouths. But if it breaks down early or it doesn't look good or it you know, tears early, so that's not very professional. And we want to be very um, um, high quality with what we provide our patients because we're talking about life and death things. We're talking about important medical outcomes. We're talking about working with, collaboratively with physicians that we want to be good partners with. And if, if our patients go back to the physician and say, well, I really like my appliance because it fits me, it's small, and the, the dentist is excited about it too, well, all that's a good positive statement to make to our collaborative partner. <coughs> if they go back to their, those same partners and say, yeah, I got this appliance and really everything's going to be expensive to a patient if they have to pay for it. If they go back to those partners and they say, well, yeah, it's this little thing here. It's just, you know, small and, and, and it's, uh, it doesn't seem very, very, you know, robust. That's not a good statement. So I like, I like them that fit well and, and look good all the time. So. So the key here really is what clinical conditions are we looking for? And as we evaluate our patients in our practices, as we deal with getting to know them and what their history is and how do we sort out all of the different choices of appliances we can choose from, then what we think about is these. And, and, and as I, I, I put this list together for this tonight's talk, I thought about, well, if I have a Bruxer, I want to give them a lot of acrylic to put the pressure on because I can't know if they're going to stop bruxing. But so I, I give them a uh, appliance that they can squeeze on. And if I make it rigid enough and the lining fits well enough, then they're not going to move teeth with that force. And that's what I have a milled device here with some of them, the a band. Then uh, short clinical crowns because although they're attached, we don't have a lot of need for retention on the teeth. It's not like some of the appliances that are connected together with a rigid connector. And if they move their jaw at all, it's going to come off their teeth. Here we have movement so we can get these patients with very short, small teeth, and we don't have to worry about too much retention uh, requirements. Um, because we have patients that have uh, uh, habits of mouth breathing, if we can give them a device that when they close together, they can close their mouth, their lips over the front of it, then we can encourage nasal breathing. And that's what we always want. So we've got to give a device that can be made with a, 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 a small interocclusal distance. So it's, it's small enough that they can uh, have good lip competency and make sure they can promote nasal breathing that way. 
I mentioned supine sleepers before because as you have that polyamide strap around the front when you're laying on your back, your jaw just can't fall backwards. And that's, that's really comfortable. And yet it's not rigid. So I love that part. <laughs> I have some patients that come to see me. I'm not a, uh, I don't do general dentistry anymore or restorative dentistry, but they come in and say, you're not going to make an appliance that's going to hurt my porcelain crowns, are you? Because, you know, I've paid a lot of money for these crowns. You're not going to hurt those. And I said, no, I've got a milled soft liner, so it's going to slide right over your porcelain restoration. You don't have to worry about that at all. And if I have patients with implant crowns. I have patients with all these different restorations we worry about. And uh, the perfect fit and the soft liner aren't going to be a problem for damaging those porcelain restorations. So again, giving patients comp uh, confidence in the device. Orthodontic uh, patients are worried about moving teeth after all the money they spent for Invisalign or braces. Again, you know, with a perfect fit of these and the ability we have of spreading whatever forces are going to be around a whole arch, we're not going to be allowed to concentrate on just the front teeth or just the side teeth. And so we're going to have a better chance of having teeth that are stable and less likely to be moving over time. And then because we have such a small device, it doesn't keep up a lot of room in the limited oral capacity of cavity that many of our sleep patients have, I can tell them that, look, if your tongue fills your whole space, uh, my, my mentor called these BFTs, big fat tongues. And if they have um, BFTs, <coughs> sometimes, uh, well, BFTs, if they have big fat tongues, then we don't want to make an appliance that's going to take up a lot more space because it's gonna, not only going to feel big in their mouth, again, another barrier to treatment, it's also going to further impede the very thing we're trying to do, which is to get the tongue out of the back of the throat. So if we can limit the amount of acrylic coverage we have over the lingual surfaces, we're going to be better off. So we make a small appliance, and I guess that's what we have here too. So when they did this study, I, I learned this as, as I was going through this training, and they, they worked with this over the course of uh, 18 months in, around the world, 180 appliances. I think the uh, four of us did, are launched dentists, I guess, and they told us 180 appliances were in the world when we got started. So approximately that. And Dr. Mark Bream, who's a big researcher in Belgium, it was part of this study. And he did this, this and found that 100% of patients were either comfortable or very comfortable with the appliance. And I can say that that's uh, true in my practice. Uh, we have had a couple of patients I can say, well, or, you know, they're kind of picky about things. And so is it going to be 100% of your patients? Unlikely, but it's going to be uh, so much that you're, that's not going to be the factor. It's not going to be the device you're going to go, oh, I don't want to order one of those because it's not going to be comfortable. It's likely to be perfect. And if it's not perfect, it's a little bit, little ways away from perfect, and we can handle that just fine. And um, the quality of sleep gets improved, I think, it's part, mostly because it's so easy to get used to doing this. It's not like some of the devices that are hard acrylic or some of the devices you have to do a lot of metal uh, work that you have to get used to the feel on the side. It's, it's simple for our patients to get going with this. So we have some videos. I rec recorded a few videos. Now what these are, I'm going to set this up. These, we hand the patients the some in Avant. And we say, put this in your mouth. We don't put it in for them. We just hand it to them. So here's some, here's some real patients in my practice. Lower. Okay, so try okay. to put it just like this way. Okay. Look at that. See, he just puts it in, and there you go. How do you feel? I um, didn't record the audio very well. Try to uh, take that okay. tight on the teeth, like it's, it was you know, it's moving tight. the teeth. No. But overall, it's okay. okay. He puts it back in. And we ask him here, he says, can you wear this okay? And he says, yeah, it's going to be all right. Okay. Do you feel? Mm-hmm. Good. Yeah, That's mm -hmm. where he's agreeing. Okay. We ask him, do you think you can wear this tonight? Can you do we do hand it to him right side up, so it's so not to worry about that part. What I always say to patients is that, you know, after a while, you're going to get so used to it. It's the very first time you've ever done this, you, you know, can in your whole try life. To and so it's not going to be perfect the first time. So you have to sort this out a little bit. Then he gets mm -hmm. it. Now he puts the top one okay. in first. He'll buy, it, he'll buy right into it next. So they, they get used to it pretty fast. Pretty soon, I, I tell them, look, after a while, you'll be mm -hmm. catching it with your mouth. Mm -hmm. 
out, being good to go. I'll do yeah. <laughs> the pun. We can make it with so uh, limited amount of, of opening compared to some of the other devices. Does it end real quick? Mm -hmm. the the even though the strap connects to the point, that, that's the one. Oh, I see. Weird. I don't see that. It's just like this thing. Yeah, oh, I guess. He likes like to watch it. Never one device Try to pick it up. But here's, it's always interesting to get, for them to get it out the first time because they don't know where to put their finger. Again, we tell them, look, you're going to learn where to put your thumbs out. I don't mind it if it's a little snug. Sometimes like yeah. So the lower is like this. Now this used to be a boss hand. A little slower. How's that feel? There you go. Just popped right into play. Ah, uh, right, right. Yeah, does it feel real tight anywhere? Or? It's nice and snug. snug. Nice and snug. Do you feel like you could wear that? Starting tonight. Um, I am tired right now, so give me about ten minutes. And I will he's talking to us. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. I never had a foreign object like this in my house. So. Between the closest to yeah. uh, uh, spot, so it's some long cusp against some op opposing occlusal. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, we've got a piece of acrylic with two layers. We've got to have some space, but the way that they've developed the materials, then, um, well, in fact, here's how we do. Here's a little video about that. So we do have to have some space. And things to watch out for are typical. We're, we're used to this. We have to watch out for these, these stepped occlusions that is really common in class twos. Eric's going to be here to answer your questions here in a, in a little bit about special cases like this. And then the other one we have to watch out for is this. When you have a tipped up terminal molar, especially on the lower, again, class twos will oftentimes be this way, and class twos are the ones that are crowded on the, uh, on the oropharynx anyway. So if we have a maxillary arch that's forward of the mandible, mandibular arch, then that last tooth on the lower might end up tucked behind the last tooth on the upper. And so it's going to end up swinging up and causing a tall cusp back there. So you have to be careful about those. You know, be a, be a good dentist. Just, you know, look at, look at your patient's mouth and identify those problems before you take the bite registration. And then when it comes in the laboratory, Eric, you can answer this later on when you're up here, is, you know, what do you do in that case? You know, if it's too narrow, that's, that's the question I have. I want you to tell everybody about that, too. Yeah, so, so it's really what we have to do is you have to just pay attention and look in here. So when you take the, when your George gauge or your Pro gauge or whatever system you're using to register this in, or to, to stabilize this in three dimensions so you can scan it you know then uh, you got to make sure that you're uh, that you're, you're seeing enough space this presentation addresses oh, clinical questions go. on the somnodent avant straps somnodent avant components include an upper plate with a strap clip at the anterior a lower plate with two hinges located on either side these plates are connected and held in position by the strap. Each strap is marked with an identifier for its size. Somnodent Avant's novel advancement mechanism involves the interchange of different length straps to provide protrusion. Higher number straps advance the mandible and lower number straps provide retrusion of the mandible. How do I choose the right strap size for the patient? Somnodent Avant is supplied with either a small, medium, or large strap kit. Each strap kit includes 10 straps, from the negative 1mm to the positive 8mm, providing a total range of 9mm. The choice of starting strap, L0, M0, or S0, is made by the Somnomed technician during manufacture. It is driven by the patient anatomy, their arch shape and size, and the total amount of protrusion in the supplied bite record. Why are there different strap sets? In early user feedback, we supplied 20 straps. The feedback was that this was confusing to patients and difficult to monitor protrusion. Therefore, Somnodent Avant is supplied with a small, medium or large set of 10 straps, providing a total range of 9mm. 
Advancement from the supplied byte record matches the strap ID. Additional strap sets are available where straps need to be replaced or a patient needs to transition to another strap set. How should I be taking the protrusive bite record? As with Somnomed's existing products, we recommend taking a protrusive bite using SOMGAGE to ensure that there is three millimeters of vertical clearance between the two closest opposing cusps across the arches. Somnodent advanced strap sets provide one millimeter of retrusion and eight millimeters of advancement. If for patient comfort reasons, more than one millimeters of retrusion from the supplied bite record is required, the device may need to be remade and the patient fitting delayed. Therefore, to simplify the fitting process, we advocate a protrusion setting of 60% of full protrusion. With eight millimeters of protrusive settings, let the straps do the work. How are the straps placed on or taken off? To attach a strap, hold the upper plate and press the white collar of the strap into the strap clip. Slide the strap around until the center is inside the strap clip. Hold strap so it is upright. Press the right strap hole over the right hinge. Hold finger over the right hinge and repeat for the left hinge. Rotate the strap down so the plates meet. To remove a strap, rotate the strap until it is upright. With the strap upright, pull it off the right hinge. Repeat for left hinge. Slide strap around until strap clip is at the white marking on the strap. Pull the strap out of the strap clip. Is that? So this range of 18 millimeters, I don't know that it's matched anywhere in, in dentistry. I don't think we have that available. And it's so simple to make this. I guess we could call these short, medium, and long too, couldn't we? Instead of small and large, we might get my vote. But, um, but you can see what happens here is as they work their way through. The, the technologist who's making the device will choose the right starting kit based on the geometry of that particular patient. So where the post goes, where the clip has to be, and they'll do some measurements and magic happens and they choose which, one, which strap kit to start with. But you can apply the strap that's appropriate for that patient across any of them. So in other words, where, even if they start with the L's, you can always get to the S's if the patient can do, needs to do that. So it's not like it only fits that one little range. So the whole thing is 18 millimeters across there. Super easy for the patients to understand, so you don't have to do it yourself. You can have the patients do this at home. This is what we do. We give them the, the kit and we tell them to titrate it themselves, and then they come back and see us. So it's pretty simple that way. It's all easy, low barriers for that. So, well, we talked about this a little bit. And one of the interesting things is because we start a lot of patients with the M strap so far, then we can go backwards. And, so, and we can, they all come with at least one millimeter backwards from the start, so which helps some patients that you've guessed a little wrong on the protrusive range. It's a little too much for their early side effects, and we want to reduce those barriers. And so we can say, look, we'll not protrude you that, that far. And that even psychologically will help them with that. So it's good. It's easy. So how you order this, well, I'm going to let... Somebody talk about that because you, here you go. Great. Before we move on to the ordering, um, I was curious about the straps. Like yeah. The ideal strap up there would have, would develop no fatigue. So, is there any recommendations on how often you change the strap if you're at a fatigue clock? Because, like an EMA strap, yeah. uh, probably no, will develop yeah. fatigue and you'll see it. And you put in a new strap with the same millimeter measurement and they're forward from where they were. Right. So, is, are there any advances on these straps lately that? May, may offset that. Yeah, absolutely. So the question was about, is there going to be stretching of these straps over time? Uh, so we've done clinical trials and testing on all of these straps under different payloads and different weights and different Newton forces. So the most that we've seen a strap stretch is two tenths of a millimeter. So you will have one millimeter adjustments and over time, and, and it'll be about two tenths at the most. Um, this also, the arch, the uh, strap is going to conform to the patient's arch over time. Whatever shape it is, it will change to that. So that, that's just in testing and then throughout the field. Now there's 700 cases that we've done um, and we still haven't seen any difference in that. 
it's a different feel strap too. It's not like the nylon or, or the flexible strap for EMAs, for example. It's a, that, it's a polyamide, right? right? And a polyamide is, I'm not familiar with what that means, but it feels solid. It doesn't feel stretchy when it's in the mouth. Yeah. And for questions, if you wouldn't mind, we're on, we're on live broadcast here too. So if you pick up the microphone on your table that Eric walked away with. You know, I think of the, you know, in regards to like the Narvel was sometimes the straps would just kind of pop off right. about the connectors. Have you had any problems with that? I know Panthera kind of improved the Narvel that way. Right. I have not had any trouble with the, uh, with the popping off of this, of this circular thing here at all. Okay. Now, um, I've been using mine since May, and so when I wash it, you know, if it gets oriented a certain way, it'll pop off, but that's just, when it goes vertical, it's supposed to pop off that way. So, it's, but in the mouth, it's, it's got a, um, it's got a, uh, a kind of a key shape there, but the, the important part is on some of the early nylon, you mentioned Narval is a critical one for this, had little tiny little wings, right? We have a nice round polyamide that doesn't stretch and a solid post that's milled, so it's, it hasn't been a problem. The moment it hits perpendicular to the splint, so the strap goes straight perpendicular, that's when it's made to pull off. Yeah. So it has, doesn't pull off in the mouth at all because they can't get their mouth open that far. Not so far anyway. What other questions do we have here? Uh, Steve, I'm a little bit concerned about the soft over a period of time, both maintaining from um, you know scrubbing and washing and everything else over a period of time, um, you've had it several months. Right. Uh, have you noticed a difference in the fit? Does this liner deteriorate the way most soft liners do? And my biggest concern is the ability for rotation and open contacts with soft liners over a period of time. So I hope you can con uh, comment on that. What I would say is that when I, when I, I, I kind of felt the occlusal surface of the soft liner to the hard shell, and so where the forces are going to be coming from if they clench down on it, for example, and that, that is so, uh, the, the soft liner depth right there is pretty limited because they're trying to get that three millimeters. So there's not a lot of compression between, of the, between the occlusal surface of the teeth and the inside of the, of the hard shell. So when, we, when they clench down, it's not going to put a lot of force into the, into the periodontal ligaments, I believe. Then when they, the, the direction of force where they have uh, torque on the tooth from a connector in the front and a post in the back, I suppose that you, you put any kind of force in that, you could move some teeth, but you've got such a, uh, an arch form that's where it's contained. So you've got the whole arch in one device that's milled. So it'd be hard to put individual forces on individual teeth to cause open contacts. We haven't seen that in our two months so far. So you had a couple other parts of that about like a delamination, how yeah. long that soft line is going to last. So our soft line proprietary to Somnomed, uh, we're the only company that has this. It actually is a PMMA base as a soft liner. It's the exact same as the outer harder acrylic shell. Oh. Um, and what this actually does is it allows now that that harder shell is extremely more durable in mill than what we had prior into the normal flex device. It actually creates a better bond. It's a one-to-one -one ratio bond now that when it's bonded, it, we don't see any sort of delamination or any sort of um, issues with that product. The other thing we've done is we've beveled the edges on the outside harder acrylic, meaning uh, any of you use our flex devices today, you actually can feel the harder acrylic layer down into the flex layer. For example, on the posteriors, you'll feel that flange as the material shift with a vaunt, we've actually beveled the edges now, the hard acrylic, so there is no edge where you can feel both materials. So it's just a harder acrylic on the inside. So it's a better bond. Um, the harder outer acrylic allows for that better uh, combination of the two. And then uh, because it's a PMA base, it's non-porous, doesn't harbor odors or delaminate. Um, for someone who have very steep curve of speed, a lot of times you would modify the, the the design. Mm -hmm. um, so the lower second molar will remove the occlusal coverage. Right. How does it work with Yvonne and also how does the lamination is going to work with the open space with the second molar? Uh, I think, what was that second the, the question? Soft liner. How does the soft, soft liner, liner? Will, will continue with, with the design of the low, lower? 
Well, the, everything is custom milled and custom designed. And so when, if you write on a prescription, what we do is we just say, stop it over here, stop it over there, and then they'll, they'll, they'll create it that way. So is that, there's still going to be an edge with the finished line for the soft liner. Yes. Right, it's going to be the same kind of thing. If we if we have to stop it halfway on a second molar because it's kicked way up or something, there's still going to be that that protected edge. Correct. Right? Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So I guess the hard acrylic will be real close to the occlusal surface of the it tube is. at that yep. point. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Follow up here. Yeah, I don't want to stay on the soft liners, but uh, the tendency with the soft appliances that people are encouraged a little bit more parafunctional activity. They kind of bite into it. They feel a like they want to choose something. So my thought would be, any thought of having the soft liner just in approximately having the intaglio surface out actually on the hard CAD CAM acrylic so there's a hard surface and you're not biting into it and getting that, resi that uh, resiliency back again. So, um, you know, the thought would be you use the soft liner in approximately, you get the very comfortable fit, yet the occlusal surface is on your CAD CAM surface so you don't get that spongy feel uh, when you're doing parafunctional activities. Just a thought. Absolutely. So one of the things, as, as Dr. Carson was saying, with this device being so thin and small, the thickness of that flex liner actually is adjusted by our technicians to make sure that we hit the right retention levels. We try to predict retention before we fabricate the devices, and that tells us how thick or thin we need to make that flex liner. And with this product being so small and thin, uh, as Dr. Carson said, there's not a whole lot of sponge or rebound as you're trying to chew in this product. There's not a whole lot of room in it. And then the outer harder acrylic is so... Um, so durable on the outside and as it encompasses the teeth, there's really not a whole lot of room to want to uh, chew and grind in the device. You know, it doesn't feel spongy in my yeah. mouth when I bite on it. Yeah. Is it similar to Astron, the polymethyl methacrylate hard shell, but a polyethyl methacrylate inner shell, which is not really soft, it bonds to it, but it's softer. Correct. You, you nailed it. So ours is a little different in a proprietary blend for us. So I can't tell you the full compound, but you're definitely on the right pathway. Um, but it is the exact same material, meaning if you want to adjust on our Flex Soft Liner, just prep it like you would a PMMA. You can clean the area and you can just add right to it some of the acrylic. Is it te temperature sensitive? Like if you heat it up to 130? It is. And you will have to adjust less? Yes, so you shouldn't have to heat it up at all. This material doesn't need to be boiled or heated. It is ready to just fit right in the mouth the moment you get it. We already do the curing to the harder acrylic in our manufacturing process. But if there were just just, just a tad, you know, you could put it in a water bath, let's say at 130 for 30 seconds, and then close uh, one of the arches or have the patient bite on one of the arches to even it out a little more? Let's say two tenths of a millimeter. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't recommend it just because these are so precise, as Dr. Carson okay. said. I mean, these are meant to drop and fit. The precision on our milling machine and our own algorithms as we design and, and make this, you shouldn't even need to do that. And I'll tell you that if it's if it's not fitting, it's normally something like the mill didn't hit a cusp of a tooth or something is off. I mean, it's right now we see it's drop and fit. Um, and I'll lean on you for your first couple of cases. How did you see that they fit and did you feel the need to do anything like that. We've had to adjust one or two. Yeah, but most of them are just been in and that's it. It's good. A little tight. I mean, a bit feel tight on a patient. But uh, we haven't had anybody coming back for their first visits, for example, and saying, I couldn't wear it because it was too tight here. Yeah, zero people doing that. Absolutely. Yeah. And then when you run into those, just call us. I mean, this is something where we got to, as this thing's rolling out, if there's any indication of an adjustment or anything, we want to know because that way we can go back and look at all the CAD CAM files and understand where do we make those rooms for improvement better in the future and make sure we don't see that again? And what's the average increase of video? Uh, let's say the average increase of video if you start at 50% uh, protrusion. Well, well, you set your 3D byte up to, to get three millimeters of interocclusal uh, distance. Right. Oh, okay. So you, you have to have three millimeters total or per arch? Three millimeters between the, the closest opposing cusps. So, so whatever the longest cusp is on, say, the upper, against its opposer, opposing occlusal surface or vice versa. Somewhere uh, the narrowest part has to be three millimeters. Yeah, but it's, it's as thin as possible. Is 
Can three you designate millimeters. that on the yeah. prescription? Yes. You oh. can see, you, if you take the bite at three millimeters, that's what they're going to make it at. They're not going to increase it automatically. Sure. If, they, if you take it too narrow, then they're going to call you or they're going to move it. They'll probably call you. To, that's what they've done one time for us. And so they call you and say, well, it's too narrow. We can't make it here. You got to, can we open it for you? Or would you like to take a new bite? They'll give you that choice. Yeah, we've been doing a study, a 3D uh, biometric study using CBCT and, and doing uh, airflow cross sections of the uh, correlating that the more video, the smaller, you know, the um, uh, velopharyngeal space, the wind pipe. So more vertical and you're making the velopharynx smaller. Yeah. So you want to make it as thin as possible. Right. So here we have a device that makes this, there's not yeah. a, a device that could be made smaller than three millimeters it looks, out there. It looks great. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And it's small uh, AP too, so it's, 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 it's small everywhere. Well, this is exciting. I haven't seen anything like that. Well, I'm glad you're here. All, yes. you know? Here's a question for you. Not, it doesn't need to be in the water because previous salmonidin devices would have to be stored in the water. Correct. So there's no metal on this. Okay. So in testing, there's no need to store this in water. You can store it dry. Okay. Yeah. And clean it with, uh, you don't need special cleaners. We, we still recommend just an ordinary cleaner, any denture cleaner you want. And, uh, and then rinse it off really good and put it in a little case. And no more of those little uh, twist cases in the bottom either because you, you don't have to... Yeah, so the case is even smaller. So people can uh, traveling with it will make it, even the case is smaller. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So just regarding the slide, we can only submit uh, images through the scanner. You don't accept impressions for the for the Avant. No. So that's the. No. So Avant is available for traditional models, impressions, or iOS scans. Uh, but in order to order Avant, we're no longer doing a paper order form. You must log into our SOM account. It's our online portal where you will be able to order Avant. And I will share with you now, if you tell your friend to go look at it, they don't see it. Only you that have attended the dinner or do the online video or watch the live stream will have the ability to see Avant on your portal. Great. Thank you. Uh, Steve, you may have commented on this earlier on the, the occlusal scheme, but I was wondering what um, whistles and bells may be available to be ordered on through the lab slip. For example, we've been playing around with around with vertical elastics and tongue lifts and and uh, and things of that nature. Um, but could you comment again on the occlusal schemes? Can you get anatomic or flat or tripoded in, in these designs? Yeah, so right now this is the design that you see here. Uh, FDA has approved it this way, 510K. We've done it through Europe and Australia. Uh, right now it is fabricated, and you'll see there's demos in your bags. Uh, it comes standard with the ER hooks. They're actually recessed into the device and have little notches that you can put the rubber bands on. Uh, discluding element or a little bite ramp in the front is an option and so is anterior opening like a breathing hole. Uh, we are working on wrap distals but we're trying to do a uh, methodical kind of decision tree meaning if you want to have your upper and lower distal wrapped but you don't want it to be increased or vertical by two to three millimeters we want that decision tree so that way it's not a person deciding it's more of a methodical approach that anytime you send us a case if it's not what you need we go down that decision tree to then have, be able to fabricate the device without having to call your office or, or do anything like that. For example, um, if you're not okay with opening three millimeters, you would like us to not wrap the uppers, continue to wrap the lowers and see what vertical we have to open at that point. So there's a couple options that we go through down the path. Um, posterior pads, tripod, I know, you know the Sturmans are here and they've done tripods for a long time, but uh, right now we don't offer those, but it doesn't mean we can't, but I wanna make sure that we have to go through quality and regulatory because if there's anything significant, We've got to go back through FDA, and we really don't want to do that because that takes a significant amount of time. So these are anatomic cups, lots of... No, they're uh, flat planes. Yes. Does it also come with the, the option of upper edentulous uh, design just like everybody else? Um, yeah, so... So as of right now, we don't have a full denture available for these yet, but we do have missing teeth or partials were good. Um, we have not come with the whole full upper. You'd have to go to our, again, our signature product line that we have today. Uh, right now with the milling process, the, as you guys know, the hard palate, the soft palate is extremely difficult to fabricate by a machine. 
right? So it's not that it can't be done, but right now we wanted to focus on just anatomical that everybody has for the most part, and then really cover the partial or missing teeth and things like that because the fit is so precise that um, if you just have missing teeth or one or two or opposing missing, it really, it takes a lot more time to be able to mill that type of product and get the fit that we're looking for. So it doesn't mean that we don't have an interest in the future, but right now it's not an option. What else? It's time to eat. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. All right. Enjoy your dinners. <laughs>